my friends, welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths. For the next hour or hour and a half, we will be reading about uh, the social history of ancient Ireland. In the meantime, if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, please do feel free to join in the conversation. Send us your comments. Say hello. We'll say hello back to you, as we have been doing since we started these live streams back in uh, 2020. Hello to all the Mythflix, to uh, wherever you are in the world. Good evening. It's 8 p.m. in Ireland. It is uh, dark twilight. And not too long ago, the sun was shining in on us here as we were live streaming. We've gone past autumn equinox and the sun is now in the lower half of the sky for the next six months. Winter is coming. Anyway, you're very welcome. As I said, uh, please do feel free to join in the conversation. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. A quick reminder that if you want to support Mythical Ireland, you can do so at Patreon or a one-off payment, uh, as it were, a, a donation, buymeacoffee.com. The patrons are being treated at the moment to, um, well, lots over the last while, actually. I think the uh, Patreon page has been very busy lately. Specifically, the Return to Segish Companion, which I am still writing, but I am sharing now two pages at a time uh, instead of the uh, old one page at a time. Um, a reminder that coming up very soon is the 2024 Mythical Ireland calendar. I'm glad to report that I've chosen the 13 images, the cover image plus one for each of the 12 months. The pre preliminary design is done. Uh, proofreading is what we're doing now. And I'm changing the format of it. So it's going to be A4 opening out into A3. So previously the calendar has been a big flat A3, but it doesn't travel too well. Um, even in card backed envelopes, it had a habit of arriving uh, to the United States in particular and Canada in uh, uh, with lots of folds and creases in it. So just to explain, just in case that isn't obvious. So the front, it'll be an A4 and it'll be a lovely compact size in post but when you put it on the wall you'll be opening it up like that and the top part will be the image and the bottom part will be the calendar which is how the current a3 calendar is with the image on top and the calendar on the bottom uh, i will be re uh, launching that for pre-order uh hopefully in the next couple of days on mythicalireland.com on the website keep an eye out for that the only reason i'm not advertising it yet is i have to work out a unit price based on the cost of printing Unfortunately, the cost of printing uh, here in Ireland anyway uh, has gone up over the last couple of years uh, for various reasons. So as soon as I'm able to set a price for it, then uh, I'll be able to take pre-orders. Uh, all going well. The thing will be printed and back here in about two weeks time. And when myself and my good lady wife, Anne, will uh, start packaging them up and sending them out to all of the two around the world who, uh, who order them. Anyway, I'd better say hello to a few people because there's quite a few people saying hello in the comments. And that's, uh, of course, wonderful to see. And that's exactly what we like here. The first commenter, uh, which is not surprising, is Elaine Dent Lingenfelter, who is in uh, Texas. And she's saying it's 31 Celsius or 88 Fahrenheit. Uh, well, that's a lot cooler than it has been, but still quite warm. That's about as warm as it ever gets in Ireland, really. Record temperature here, 33.3 degrees Celsius. So... Yeah, that's still pretty hot. Uh, Sandra Boothroyd is saying, evening all in for uh, an interesting evening. Well, I hope you enjoy it. I certainly hope it will be interesting. Uh, and that would make my day if you found it interesting. Michael Pike is in the house. Michael, also a Mythical Ireland patron. Michael, a very good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Tuesday Thompson is saying, happy Mythology Monday. On a Monday, best way to start the week. <laughs> yeah, Or skip Monday and just go straight to Tuesday, you know, because as the Boomtown Rats used to sing, tell me why I don't like Mondays. Joe Butler, who's anti-Joe, is in Colorado. Beautiful weather there. Hope you're all, I hope all of you are well. Well, I'm in good form, Joe, and I hope you are uh, likewise well. And thanks for joining us and, of course, for sharing the stream to the usual, to the Mythical Ireland community and Mythical Ireland creatives. Wayne Bird is in the house. Good evening. Wayne is in England, of course. Hope everyone is keeping well. Glad to see your comments on all the Patreon posts, Wayne. You're clearly enjoying it, which is brilliant. Um, and, uh, yeah, I uh, have to get that... Uh, Companion volume finished. Uh, just been quite busy with tours and everything. And Scott Doherty's in the house. Hope everyone is well and ready for story time. And Anne is in the Boyne Valley. I actually met her yesterday uh, at uh, during my uh, 
Bruna Bonia Walk as part of the September uh, Walking Festival, the Boyne Valley Trails September Walking Festival. Actually, uh, my honour to uh, lead what was actually the last event of the entire week, uh, a seven day long um, programme of walks and some talks, sorry, yes, walks and a few talks, which didn't require anybody to walk like the one I gave in the punt in Drogheda on Monday evening. So uh, I participated in three events. The the uh, What Can Myth Tell Us About the Boyne Monuments uh, on Monday evening, which was a talk in the Punt Pub in Drogheda. Uh, Saturday, of course, I had uh, the Myths and Legends of Tara with a lovely group of people, uh, including Deirdre Wadding and her friends. Uh, Deirdre, a special hello to Deirdre, and thanks for coming along, and indeed uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. And then yesterday, Sunday, the Bruna Bonia walk. We walked from the visitor center to Douth, from Douth to Nouth, and from Nouth to Newgrange and back to the visitor center. Eight kilometers, five miles in total. Weather forecast said uh, heavy rain, widespread heavy rain, and strong winds. We got some of the strong winds. We got a heavy rain for about five minutes, but actually it was mostly it didn't rain on us. We were so lucky. And it was great to meet Anne Scott Doherty as we left Douth and headed down the road for Nouth. Um, Elaine uh, is being invited by Joe Butler to come to Colorado. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. I like that. Uh, Brendan Byrne is saying a blush on the birch trees today. The season is changing. Good evening, all. Yeah, and I know there's actually some trees are dropping their leaves already. Maybe that's premature. I did notice, um, was that yesterday? Yes, coming back down to the visitor center yesterday at Bruna Bonia, noticed a huge swarm of, I don't think they were swallows. I think they were uh, sand martins. And they're going to be gone in a week. They won't be here much longer. Then you'll know summer as well and truly over. Helen, Her Helen Hurst Shader is back in the Black Hills after a wonderful two weeks in Ireland. Greetings to Anthony and the Tua. Well, yes, indeed, uh, Helen. And it was a pleasure to meet you here uh, and uh, to show you around some of the Boyne Valley sites. What a pleasure. Um, yet another of the uh, Mythical Ireland Tua uh, I have finally managed to meet in person. Uh, and... Uh, a wonderful time also with the prehistory guys. Weren't they fabulous? Gavin O'Flaherty is uh, the Cove Gooner. Evening, everyone. Good evening to you, Gavin. Welcome, welcome. Caitlin Moon was here very early because she doesn't think she's ever seen the countdown timer. Uh, yes, good evening to you. Caitlin is in Dublin. Hope the uh, PhD um, proofing and editing is going well. Uh, and Tom King is amazing as well. What a treat to visit the forge. Yeah. Isn't he great crack altogether? I hope he's here. Susan Scott is saying greetings from a soggy, cold Connecticut. It is winter there already. Weather's raw outside, but I'm all cozied up and ready for a great session this afternoon. Perfect day for a good listen. Well, Susan, that sounds very comfy. And yeah, I'm glad to hear that the viewers and watchers of Life Irish Myths are comfortable. That's uh, extremely important. Sally Siggins is uh, saying greetings from Windy Sligo. Lovely to see you and your guests in Carramore recently. Well, Sally, the pleasure was all ours. Uh, oh, I mean, thanks for organizing the weather, first of all. I mean, uh, it was 24 degrees Celsius at sunset. Uh, and by the time I got home to Drogheda, which was about half 11 at night, it was 18 Celsius. An incredible day. But uh, we thoroughly enjoyed our time at Carramore. Uh, and thank you for your expertise. Um, really uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned, uh, in fact, you may have noticed that I was taking notes on my phone. Uh, I, I, I learned things that I didn't know. Um, so thank you for hosting us uh, and uh, for being for being willing to impart with so much of your knowledge. Anna L says, me too. Guess I couldn't wait for today's Netflix. Uh, Anna L is down the road in, in the, I was going to say Limerick. No, she's not in Limerick. She's in Balbriggan. How dare I even try to make a comparison between those two things? Casper is saying, please check your email. I'm waiting almost half a year. Okay. Don't know what that's about, but maybe just forward it again. Um, I'm inundated with emails, so it's easy to miss stuff. Um, Joe Butler is sh saying shared too. Thanks, Joe. Tom King is here, indeed, he is. Hello there, Anthony and the Mighty Two. A spectacular moon. Oh, I saw it earlier. Fabulous. Looking in at the forge, all ready for story time and looking forward. Hope all in good fettle. I'm good form here, Tom. And uh, yeah, lots of commentary uh, recently about your uh, your your Triscoll uh, whole. Uh, whole discussions about it taking place with various groups. 
Uh, and of course, me telling everybody you can get them on the Mythical Ireland website. Uh, Theresa Collins, jo Dog the Eve, uh, to a Galeer. Well, uh, yeah, August uh, Boan, uh, Ditch, uh, Theresa, good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Archeo Linguistic Adventures with, oh, oh, yes, I can't see the full title of your name here. I have to go to YouTube to see that, and I can't remember what it is. But anyway, uh, good afternoon to you, and thanks for joining us from Pennsylvania. What a pleasure. To see all our friends from the other side of the Atlantic joining us. Um, who else is in the house? Northman. Love your channel at Mythical Ireland. Well, thank you. I hope you can tolerate the typewriter stuff that's been popping up lately. That's another hobby of mine. Uh, but yeah, uh, brilliant. And I'm glad you're enjoying it. 1,500 videos and recorded live streams. Johnny Wilson is in Dallas, Texas. Where it's raining. No, it doesn't rain in Dallas. I don't believe it. Are you sure it isn't a fountain you're standing under? Well, Johnny, I'm sure that rain is a bit of a relief because I understand Dallas is quite a dry, arid place. Kelly Nikelly is saying hello from the Emerald City to the Emerald Isle, all the way over there in the far northwestern corner of the United States in the Pacific Northwest. Kelly, it's so good to see you again. John Main is saying Banachthy to all the tour from Crete, where the wind blows in from Africa. Nice and cool, 25 today. Oh, yeah. I was just saying earlier how a hot a hot day in Ireland is 24. And John says, yeah, nice and cool at 25. But then in fairness, um, you know, all those times you were in Ireland in different parts, especially when you're in Belmullet. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of owed a few nice days as a result of that, in fairness, you know. And Tom King says to Elaine, it's 1,500 degrees in the forge. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Karen Hart is saying it's chilly in Pittsburgh. First day of autumn is upon us. The seasons are turning, Karen. Definitely, we're noticing it. John Inman is waiting with bated breath for the calendar. <laughs> brilliant stuff, John. Uh, ASAP, literally, uh, hopefully, in the next day or two. Um, and, of course, as soon as I... Make it available on the Mythical Ireland shop on the website. I will, of course, share the link with all the social media. Uh, Fiona Newman is in Canada today. Fiona, good afternoon to you. Uh, previously in Ashbourne and previously in other places, uh, you travel well. And uh, I hope you're in a nice, comfortably warm part of Canada and not a really cool part. Maureen Joyce is uh, in uh, Lexington in Kentucky. Hope all are well. Greetings to you, uh, Maureen, also. Uh, you're very welcome to Live Irish Mits. Don Hilton is in the house. Hi, Anthony. Love to you all. Well, the same to you, Don. Thank you uh, for your kindness. And you're very welcome to the stream, as always. Alva Kelly is saying to Nonoa, it's great to sit back and enjoy the storytelling this evening. Slauncha. Well, I hope you do enjoy it. We've been having fun with this Joyce work. It's brilliant. Uh, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. And John tells us that's this is a ditto from Facebook, but it's a soft day, as you would say, but we call it a gully washer. <laughs> Eureka, California. We need it. Damps the fires. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Regina Riley says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Hope you are well. Is it true you've taken up Irish dancing or yoga? <laughs> no. One-legged yoga, would that be? Uh, no, uh, not by uh, scene. I've never seen anybody doing one-legged yoga at Tara, so... Uh, I don't know what that's about, but anyway, I'll be I'll be speaking to Mon Con about that soon. Sally Siggins says, "Welcome anytime. Plenty more Sligo stories. West Northwest is best. Can't argue with that. It's a fabulous landscape, really beautiful part of the world, and I always feel actually a little bit emotional when I'm leaving Sligo to go back to the Boyne Valley. It's it's like I don't want to go. It's like I know home is in the east, but." There's a part of me in the West too. Uh, Erica Bow says, good afternoon to all. Well, a good afternoon to you, Erica, watching on YouTube. I hope you're in good form. And uh, Archaeolinguistics Adventures with uh, Nolan from Pennsylvania. Well, thank you, Nolan from Pennsylvania. A uh, 322 Messenger is I here again. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, 322 Messenger. Sharon O'Farrell is also here. Sharon, hope you're in good form. Um, it's been a while, but I uh, haven't seen you in a bit. Uh, I mean, in person. Uh, I've seen you a few times this summer. Uh, Judy McQueen says, hello. Good afternoon to you, Judy. Welcome to Live Irish Mits. And uh, we're all up to date, I think. Um, Northman, what do you think about Munster megaliths, mostly in case odd drombeg? Okay. Uh, what do I think about Munster megaliths? I don't know. 
It is a strange one, isn't it? That the stone circles, that there's a big cluster of them down there. You know, they don't really have anything in the way of megalithic passage tombs. I know there's supposed to have been one on Cape Clear on the island, but um, there's not much left of that, unfortunately. There certainly was some megalithic art there. I uh, don't know exactly what the question is, um, but uh, what do I think of them? I think they should stay in Munster. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Gordon A. Farrell is in this morning. And what morning? Are we not in Longford, Gordon? Whereabouts in the world are you, my dear friend? Karen Fay O'Loughlin is, oh, no, that's skipped a comment there, in Boulder in Colorado. Perfect autumn weather, warm, dry, aspen leaves turning golden yellow. My Monday appointments have ended. Hope to be joined more often. Miss you guys. Brilliant stuff, Karen. Lovely to see you again. And yeah, some other people here saying the leaves are starting to turn, uh, Brendan Byrne in particular. Uh, Brendan says, I feel the same way about Donegal. Always sad to leave it. Yeah, Sligo has really taken a, uh, a little piece of my heart, as it were, you know. You got a great photo of the ass in the past, the Gaelic chieftain near Boyle. Yes, that one's going into the calendar. So there you go. I've Oh, oh I've let it slip out. Uh, one of the 13 images has been revealed. I just thought it was too good. Uh, I just, I got lucky. I just arrived there. I, I knew the sun was setting and I said, I'm going to stop. And it just happened that the statue was in such a place that I could get the sun under it. So brilliant. Good go soon, says Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, lots of conversation going on between all the others, which is fantastic. Brilliant. Welcome, welcome. Pardon the noise in the background. That is our new smoothie maker. Um, can I get um, banana and blueberry, please? That's a tall order. Well, it would be if it was in a tall glass. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay, Anthony, shut up and keep going. So today we are back reading, of course, A Social History of Ancient Ireland by P.W. Joyce, Volume 1. We're on the chapter that deals with government, military system and law, Last, which is Chapter 4. Last week we read the section Warfare. This week, week we're reading Section 2 of this chapter, which is Military Ranks, Orders and Services. Now... It's highly possible. Let me just, I'm leafing through it here. This is a big section. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to read all of this this evening. But look, we will carry on. And I know that you people are interested. And you know what? I've learned so much from this book so far. I've actually incorporated some of what we've been talking about into a couple of my tours lately. So um, if you see me stopping and you'll see me with the Piao uh, Louis. In my love, August May, excrave er on pop air, er in the marginalia. <laughs> You'll know that I'm taking notes in the margins because I'm getting excited about stuff that I'm reading. Uh, so forgive me for that if there is a brief interruption. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay. 322 Messenger says, smooth. Smooth smoothie. Military ranks, orders and services. At different periods of our early history, the kings had in their service bodies of militia who underwent a yearly course of training and who were at call like a standing army whenever the monarch required them. Mm -hmm. In times of peace, prepare for war. Isn't that what they say? The most celebrated of these were the Red Branch Knights of about the time of the Incarnation and the Fianna, or Fina, F-E-N-A, of Aaron. The Fianna properly spelled F-I-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Uh, thank you, Don. It is quite crowded at this stage. Not room for hardly another volume. Uh, oh, speaking of which, sorry, before I go on, I have to show you the latest acquisition. It's right behind me here. Early Irish Farming by Fergus Kelly. Fergus Kelly is the same gentleman who wrote a book about uh, the Brehan Laws. Um, and uh, a guide to early Irish law is what it's actually called. And I saw this in the old bookshop on the Hill of Tara. Now it's a new book. It's not It's not an old one. And it cost a, a pretty penny. Uh, but I just thought farming is so important in relation to Brunabonia, in relation to the Neolithic, in relation to everything that happened from the arrival of 
the Neolithic farmers in Ireland about 6,000 years ago uh, until modern modern times, uh, cattle especially, uh, and, and of course crops, such an important part of our landscape and our economy and our community. So I'm really looking forward to reading uh, this. I, I started it uh, and uh, really looking forward to getting stuck into that. That's Early Irish Farming. And that is published by the... Um, uh, the School of Celtic Studies, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, not quite sure. Uh, it's a, I think it's around fifty-five euros or something like that. Like it's not, it's not cheap, but it's wonderful scholarship, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, over seven hundred pages. Uh, I would consider it a must-have, but I didn't say that before now. But it's a must-have now that I have it. You know. Sally Siggins wants to know, how did they get the cattle in the boats? I think that's a brilliant question, Sally. And over to you. Uh, you can give us the answer. I know what you're joking. I have no idea. But I mean, you can imagine what it's like trying to corral cattle into some sort of boat. I mean, don't forget, too, I'm, 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 I, I, I'm intrigued by the red deer because the red deer, they, they buried antler objects in the passage tombs. And uh, it was the same Neolithic farmers who brought red deer to Ireland, wasn't it? I understand. Interesting stuff. Lexi Erickson is in the house from south of Denver, Colorado, in the Highlands Ranch. Good afternoon to you, Lexi. Uh, you're uh, so welcome. It's great to see you. Uh, Diane uh, Patricia Dixon says, hi, good. Uh, hello, Diane. Not sure where you are. Either good evening, good afternoon, good morning, or good night, depending on where you are. But you're very, very welcome. Has anyone heard from Desira? Yes, she was on um, last week, I think. And I saw some Facebook updates from her. So um, she's she's definitely around and about, as they say. Sally says, drugged them, I'd say. Right. Well, actually, it's pot quite, I mean, you know, but with what drugs and how? Yeah, interesting. Mm, how did they get the cattle onto the boats? They had to get them to move, says Caitlin. Didn't realize the viewers were going to fall to my dreadful standards of humor. But that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, yes. Edward Curry is Eddie from Ballina. Is that Ballina in County Mayo? Or Ballina? There's another Ballina, isn't there? Uh, Eddie, uh, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to see you there. Uh, sorry, I got totally distracted there talking about farming. Um, where was I? Yes, the Fianna or the Fianna who flourished in the third century. Though the accounts that we have come down to us of these two military organizations are much mixed up with romance and fable, there is sufficient evidence, both literary and material, to show that they really existed and exercised great influence in their day. Red Branch and Fianna really existed. Uh, yes, Mayo, says Eddie. Brilliant stuff. Good stuff. Land bridge before the boats. No, no land bridge in the Neolithic, Brendan. Land bridge was long, long gone. Um, they have to have been brought by boat, which is why, by the way, we have no snakes because there was no land bridge. Um, not because St. Patrick got rid of them all, believe it or not. I know, shock horror, right? <laughs> have you got many pentagonal stones in Ireland in the Neolithic fields? Pentagonal? I don't think so. <clears throat> Having said that, there was a standing stone in, I think it's Piper's Town here in County Louth, that I think was five sided. Big block of a thing. I got totally distracted there. And I do apologize. And no, uh, no uh, harm to the commenters who are distracting me. It's not uh, your fault. It's the fact that I kind of got pulled away from from one book to talk about another. The Red Branch Knights belonged wholly to Ulster, and in the ancient tales, they're represented as in the service of Conchovar MacNessa, or Conor MacNessa, we might call him, or sometimes uh, we, we, we say Crohor, king of that province, but not king of Ireland. The king's palace was Awen, or uh, uh, how do you, E-M-A-N-I-A, -A. is it uh, Awenia? near Arma, let's just call it Awanmaka, of which a description will be found in chapter XX, sect 5, infra. 
Every year during the summer months, the various companies of the Knights came to Owen under their several commanders to be drilled and trained in military science and feats of arms. The greatest Red Branch commander was Cuchulain, a demigod, the mightiest of the heroes of Irish romance. Hmm, mightiest of the heroes. Hmm, Finn McCall might have something to say about that. Have a standing stone on the home farm is pentagonal, but no evidence it's Neolithic, but a near, but is nearby a portal tomb. Yeah, uh, and of course the standing stone here in County Loud, uh, we wouldn't be able to tell you what date that's from. Um, you know, I think a lot of standing stones are said to be Bronze Age. Um, without actually lifting the stone out of the ground and finding dateable material in the socket, it's very difficult to tell really, isn't it? I just found two, Anthony within a huge 222 feet circle. Tell me more. Send me an email and screenshots. That sounds fascinating. Uh, where did I say Piper's Town? Let me just have a quick look and see if there's any designation. Oh, here we go. I'm a, I'm only, like I haven't even read a full page yet and already I'm in a rabbit hole. Piper's Town, Phillips Town, where are we? Cars Town, Tullard, Carn Town. Liscurry, Town Rath, it's out further, isn't it? Cars Town, Primate Park, Newhouse, Bally McKenney, Piperstown, here we go. Standing Stone, situated in flat pasture, large block of limestone with long axis resembling cup marks these appear to be natural solution holes yeah not sure if that's the one for which i apologize yeah i'd have to dig it out i know that not the stone of course i photographed that stone years and years ago um on my way up to drum drum shallon with richard moore Oh my God, do you know what? That has to be 23, 24 years ago. Oh yes, I've seen that song. I wish I was a standing stone on YouTube. A bit of fun there from Caitlin. So the boats were not using horsepower. Brendan has also descended into that grimy gutter that is the level of uh, humour that I am generally at. Mavanway Milward has joined us. Finally caught the live episode. I hope everyone's well and had a wonderful autumn equinox. All good except for the slippery slope of the sun going downhill towards winter. Yeah, fine. Joe Butler is talking about rabbit holes again. Yes. Oh, Anthony, stop. Just read the damn thing. Hmm, yes. The other chief heroes were Connell Carnock, Lyra or Leary the Victorious, Keltar of the Battles, Fergus MacRoy, the poet Brickryu Nenthanga, Venom tongue <laughs> who lived at Loch Brickland, which is anglicized uh, the anglicized version of Loch Brickran, Loch Brickland, uh, in Loch Brickland, County of Down. Is it anybody here? Uh, no, perhaps correct me whether I'm right or wrong about that. Loch Brickland is that the county of Down or is it the county of Armagh? I think it's Down. But please, somebody tell me whether I'm right or wrong. Where his fort still remains near the little lake and the three sons of Ishna, Nashi, Einle and Ardon. The Red Branch Knights had a passion for building great duns or forts, many of which remain to this day and excite the wonder and awe of visitors. Besides Awan Macha, there is the majestic fort of Dundalgan, Cuchulain's residence, a mile west of the present town of Dundalk, that is, also in the county of Louth, which is where Drogheda is, which is where I am currently. Lovely to be back. I tried to find you all last Monday, but I don't think it was enough. No, it was postponed to Tuesday. Uh, the last two episodes were on Tuesday evening, uh, Mavanway. We're so I'm sorry we missed you, uh, but I'm glad to see you. Martina uh, Droli Linsky is in the house. Hello, hello there. And yes, indeed, the two are crowding in this evening as we head towards the winter and people start to say ah do you know what i'm not going to go out as much because the weather's not as nice i think i'll watch live irish myths this dun consists of a high mound surrounded by an earthen rampart and trench 
all of immense size, even in their ruined state. But it has lost its old name and is now called the Moat of Castletown, while the original name Dundalgan, slightly altered, has been transferred to Dundalk. Another of these Red Branch Knights residences stands beside Down Patrick, which is definitely in the county of Down, viz. the great fort, anciently call, called, among other names, Dun Keltar or Rath Keltar or Aris Keltar, who lived, uh, where lived the hero Keltar of the battles. Tom Lawler, great to see alive De Del's bit, County Tipperary, as in the devil's bit, the bit that he bit out of the mountain and spat into the plain to become Corrig Forig. What am I talking about? Cashel, of course. Nobody has answered, so I am going to Google search Loch Brickland and tell you what county it is in. Since nobody, I think, I haven't seen anybody saying yes or no, whether it is. So I take it nobody knows. Loch Brickland is near Ban Bridge, which is in mm, what county? Yep, it is in the county of Down. I should not have doubted myself. Mavanway says, ah, I was driving through the torrential rain from North Wales last Tuesday. Ooh. Loch Brickland, Ban Bridge, says Gemma. Yep, in the county of Down. So Kelter of the Battles, this is the one near Down Patrick. It consists of a huge embankment of earth, nearly circular, with the usual deep trench outside it, covering a space of about 10 acres. Still another, which figures much in the old romances under its ancient name, uh, Dunnaben, but now called Mount Sandal, crowns the high bank over the Cuts waterfall on the Ban near Coal Rain. And of course, that it was originally uh, the site of uh, the uh, oldest Mesolithic or the oldest dated Mesolithic settlement on the island of Ireland, Mount Sandell. Four miles west of this is a similar fortress now known by the name of the Giants Sconce, which is the ancient Dun Cairn or Dun Cairn, so called from Cairn of the Brilliant Deeds, a famous Red Branch Knight. Uh, was Cairn the same one as the one who fought in the town and was replenished in the Bath of Marrow? You're the star of County Down, Anthony. Not quite sure what that means, uh, but thank you. I'll take it as a compliment. And uh, Mavanway, yes, is shouting County Down after I said it. Yes, brilliant. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Um, what happens here is some of the comments come like three or four minutes after the section. You know, take, it can take them a couple of minutes to appear. It's a song, says Caitlin. Yeah, but what is it about? You know, what is it about? John de Courcy's original castle of Dundrum in Down was built on the site of one of the most formidable of all, Dunrory, the immense earthworks of which still remain round the present castle at the base of the rock, though the original Dun Mound on the top was levelled by the castle builders. Contemporary with the Red Branch Knights were the the, uh, the Dagads of Munster. Just making sure that print is a bit thick there. I thought it said Dogda for a minute. The Dagads of Munster. Uh, we were talking plenty about the Dogda yesterday at Bruna Bonia and at Newgrange and thanking him for keeping the rain off us. Uh, yes, contemporary with the Red Branch Knights were the Dagads of Munster, but of Ulster extraction, whose chief was Kuri Makdara, King of South Munster, and the uh, Gem Gemanradi, or in Irish, Gawanraige, Gawanraige, Rige, or A-I-D-E, Gawanraige of Connacht, commanded by Keth MacMagach and by the renowned hero Ferdiad. Ferdia, I presume, the uh, the same, the, the uh, Good friend of Cucullan who fought with Cucullan in Time Bocunia. Conrad Reader is in Illinois. First time watching from FB. Well, a good afternoon to you, Conrad. Thanks for joining us and good to see you on Facebook. And I hope all is well with you and everybody is in good form in Illinois. Curie McDara lived in a cahar or stone fort on a rocky shelf 
2,050 feet over the sea on the mountain of Cahar Conry near Tralee, whose ruins have been lately and for the first time been described correctly and in detail by Mr. P.J. Lynch. Proceedings of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, 1899, page 5. Wow. Early excavations. As is still further evidence that the, those old legends and romances about Kuri rest on a foundation of fact, not only is the old stone fortress there to witness, but like Awen and Crave Rua in the north, it retains its ancient name, which has been extended to the whole mountain and which commemorates the mighty hero himself. For Cahar Conry correctly represents the sound of the Irish name Cahar Conry, a Cahar or stone fortress of Kuri. Uh, that's Kuri, uh, the hound of the king, isn't it? Uh, genitive Conry, Con, Ku, same thing, hound. Uh, Maureen Joyce says, uh, the song is about a lovely girl with nut brown hair and brown eyes. I knew a man from Northern Ireland who loved to sing that song, Raymond McLaughlin. Ah, I must look it up. I don't know it. I don't actually know it. Now, I can't play it here uh, because I'll probably get a, a copyright strike from, from YouTube, but I'll look it up afterwards. There you go. Star of County Down. The Red Branch Knights, as well as those, as those of Munster and Connacht, used chariots both in battle and in private life. Chariot racing, too, was one of their favourite amusements, and the great heroes are constantly described in the tales as fighting from their chariots. The Fianna, uh, so far as we can trace their history with any certainty, lasted for about a century, viz. from the reign of Con the Hundred Fighter, Con Cade Cahoc, High King of Tara, AD 177 to 212, to that of Carberry Lifacher, or Carberry of the Liffey, 279 to 297. They attained their greatest power in the reign of Cormac MacArt. 254 to 277 under their most renowned commander Finn, the son of Coal or Finn McCool as he's co commonly called, King Cormac's son-in-law, who is recorded in the annals to have been killed beside the Boyne when an old man in AD 283. Their ordinary strength in time of peace was three kaha or battalions, each ka. 3,000, so 9,000 in all. But in war, they were brought up to seven kaha, or 21,000. Before admission to the ranks, candidates were subjected to certain severe tests. Algebra? Oh, not that kind of test. Both physical and mental, which may be seen in Keating, page 349. Of course, when he mentions Keating, that's Geoffrey Keating's History of Ireland. One of these tests is worthy of special mention here. No candidate was allowed to join the ranks unless he had mastered a certain specified and large amount of poetry and tales. That is to say, he had to prove that he was a well-educated man, according to the standard of the times. A provision that anticipated uh, by 17 centuries the condition of admission to the higher posts of our present military service, designed to ensure that every commissioned officer of the army shall be a man of good general uh, education. That's interesting. So soldiers had to be educated men. Um, doesn't say anything about the women. Cannot but wonder how many men it would take and how long to construct those defensive mounds around a fort. What did they use to move so much earth? Good question. Uh, and uh, yeah, be done in half the time if the women did it. Uh, Kath, that yes, I have to throw in the uh, mention of the uh, the ladies because they they get very little mention in these things. Uh, Kathy Maydale has joined us on our lunch hour. A very rainy, cold day with a chance of thunderstorms. Hope all are doing wonderful. All good here, Kathy May. Thanks for joining us as always on your lunch break. Most people would be would just be unpacking the suitcase, says Brendan. This, whether history or legend, shows what was regarded as the general standard of education in Ireland in those times. The Fina of Aaron and Finn himself are frequently mentioned in our earliest writings 
among others, Cormac's glossary. Dawn suggests that the women were finding the stones. I always knew they were doing something more important. Of all the heroes of ancient Ireland, Finn is most vividly remembered in popular tradition. Pinkerton, the Scotch historian who was anything but favourable to Ireland's claims to early civilization or importance, thus speaks of him. Quote, he seems to have been a man of great talents for the age and of celebrity in arms. His formation of a regular standing army trained to war, in which all the Irish accounts agree, seems to have been a rude imitation of the Roman legions in Britain. Why does it always have to be rude? Because it's Irish. The idea, though simple enough, shows prudence, for such a force alone could have coped with the Romans had they invaded Ireland. There you go. That's the reason the Romans didn't come to Ireland, was because of Finn and the Fianna. Go on, Finn. Finn had his chief residence on the top of the hill of Allen, a remarkable flat-topped hill, not anymore, since it has been quarried away, half of it, lying about four miles to the right of the railway as you pass Newbridge and approach Kildare, rendered more conspicuous of late years by a tall pillar erected on the top, on the very site of Finn's house. Its ancient name was Alvu, uh, genitive Alvan, uh, which is pretty correctly represented uh, in sound by the present name Alan. Alvu says the old tale of the cause of the Battle of Knucha in the Book of the Dun Cow was Finn's principal residence where he lived. The house was not, however, built by Finn, but by his maternal ancestor Nuada, King uh, Moore's chief druid, not to be confused with Nuada or Nuadu Silver Arm, uh, one of the kings, the early kings of the Tuatha de Danann. Romans got to Anglesey, yes, and they heard all about Finn and the Finn, and they said, no, we're not going over there to Ireland. We'll get slaughtered. We're going to stay here. So far as we can judge from the accounts of its construction given in the above-named tale, it was built altogether of wood, like the red branch, without any earthen uh, uh, rampart around it. And accordingly, no trace of a rampart or earthen dun remains. To this day, the whole neighbourhood round the hill teems with living traditions of Finn and the Fianna. When not employed in training or fighting, the Fianna spent the six months of summer, from 1st of May to the 31st of October, hunting and lived on the produce of the chase, camping out all of the time. During the remaining six months, they were billeted on the well-to-do people all over the country, fed and lodged free. It's interesting, isn't it, that there's almost sort of, and this is supposed to be the first centuries AD, you know, the beginning of, well, the beginning of the beginnings of the medieval period, still in the Iron Age. Um, uh, and we're still, it looks like uh, people are still uh, engaged in hunter gathering, basically. But they were at all times, summer and winter, liable to be re-embodied at a central station by the king when he found it necessary to wage war. They were divided into distinct tribes or clans belonging to the several provinces, each under its own commander. Of these, the clan Baskin of Leinster, under the immediate command of Finn, and the clan Morna of Connacht, commanded by Golmac Morna, uh, were rival tribes. And ever since the time of when Gol slew Finn's father Cool in the Battle of Knocha, now Castle Knock near Dublin, regarded each other with hatred and disgust. Taking a uh, margin note here for a second. Clan Baskin and Clan Mac McMorna. Yeah, correct, Brendan. A good observation. Uh, if you had to be educated to be a fighting man, that would suggest that education was widespread in Ireland at that time, or your army would be very small. Remembering that it could swell to what did they say? 21,000. Yeah. It would seem that it was indeed widespread. These Fianna, those Fianna and their leaders, though supposed to be in the service of the monarch, were very uncertain in their allegiance. Sometimes they fought on his side, sometimes against him. After King Cormac's death, they became openly rebellious and attempted to impose a military despotism on the country, claiming in some respects to rule even the monarch of Ireland. Wow. At last, the king, Carberry of the Liffey, Cormac MacArthur's son, who came to the throne in 279 AD, marched against them 
and annihilated them in the bloody battle of Gaura or Gavra near Screen in County Meath. But he was himself slain in the battle. And that's the valley, the Gaura Valley between Tara and Screen. We have seen that the Red Branch Knights and their contemporary heroes of Munster and Connacht fought, rode and raced in chariots and that they erected immense duns or forts. In both these respects, the Fianna of Erin stand in complete contrast. In none of the tales or other literature of the Fianna is it mentioned that they used chariots in battle, and they scarcely ever used them in any way. Their rejection of chariots as a feature of their organisation must have been by deliberate choice. For as will be shown in chapter XXVII, Sect 2, Chariots were used all over Ireland, both in civil and military life, not only before and after the time of the Fianna, but during the whole period of their existence. For instance, so that's interesting, the uh, the Fianna did not use chariots. Sorry. Um, yes, Fianna spurned, one would say. Fascinating. Red Branch Knights used them. Fianna didn't. Ooh, is that up beside Rathlew? Yes, that would be the area, Mar area Martina. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. H.M. McGreevy says, gotcha on my lunch break. A Royal Grande, California. Well, good afternoon to you, H.M. McGreevy. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, for joining us and hope you enjoy the uh, episode. Who else? Lexi and Barbara Murphy is in the house apparently. Did I say hello to Barbara earlier? I may have, for which apologies if I did or didn't. And I can't, if I did and I can't remember, or if I didn't, uh, apologies one way or the other. According to legend in the sixth century, the giant bones of the Irish chief. Uh, Seragi were buried in Hollyhead at the site of St. Sibby's Church, though he lost the battle. The Welsh were so impressed by his fighting, they gave him a fine burial. That sounds typically Irish, isn't it? Get defeated, but get an honorary burial, an honourable burial by your enemies. Fantastic stuff. Uh, for instance, they figure, that is, chariots, in the Battle of Crynia, AD 254, at the very time when the Fianna were in all their glory. Moreover, there is evidence to show that the Fianna knew the use of chariots, though they did not adopt them. Then, as to duns, while we have still remaining the majestic ruins of many of the forts erected by the Red Branch Knights, as shown on page 84, there are, so far as I can find out, no corresponding forts in any part of Ireland attributed to the Fianna in the ancient tales. Even on the Hill of Allen, where if anywhere we might expect to find a mighty fortification like that at Downpatrick, there is no vestige of a wrath. Well, there certainly isn't now because it's a quarry. Finn had another residence in Moyella, now Moyali or Moyeli near Clara in Kings County. That would be County Offaly, where there are vivid traditions about him. And a cave is still pointed out, which the people say belong to him. But there is no dun or wrath in the place and no tradition that such a fort ever existed there. No forts, large or small, that I know of commemorate any others of the great leaders. Oshian, Oscar, uh, Dermot O'Dina, Gol McMorna, Coilche McRonan, Conan Mile, such as we have for Cuchulain, Keltar of the Battles, Cahern of the Brilliant Deeds, Kuri McDara and others. Why the Fianna neither used chariots nor built great forts appears, however, to be sufficiently explained by their organisation and the sort of life they led. They rejected chariots because they were organised purely as an infantry force, and an infantry force they remained to the last. For the same reason, they made little use of horses, except in racing, though on long journeys, their leaders sometimes travelled on horseback. Forgive me for that. Long weekend, tired and all that. All the walking, Boyne Valley Trails. Barbara Murphy, I snuck in a bit late. Well, that's okay. I'm glad that you're here uh, and that you're in good form. 
One of the main objects of their lives was to perfect their activity, strength and health by physical training. And accordingly, they constantly practiced athletic exercises on foot, running, leaping, wrestling and hunting. Then they built no enduring forts, for they did not need them in as much as they always, when not on campaign, hunted and camped out during the six months of summer, constantly changing their residence. While during the winter half year, they were billeted in the house of the chiefs and farmers. Yet we know that during all this time, uh, kings and chiefs who needed permanent homesteads continued to build rats, lisses and duns for their residences all through Ireland. Ordinary war, ordinary war service was of several kinds. Every man who held land in any sort of tenancy was obliged to bear a part in the wars of the tribe and in the defence of their common territory. Or, as the law expresses it, every land occupier owed to the chief, quote, service of attack and defence, unquote. And that's from the Brehan Laws. The number of days in the year that each should serve was strictly defined by law. And when the time was ended, he might return to his home unless some very special need arose. A chief or king, if required, was bound to send a certain number of men fully armed for a fixed time periodically to serve his superior in war. The men of the superior king's own immediate territory with the contingents supplied to him from the several subordinate tribes by their chiefs went to form his army. The tributary chief again made up the contingent to be sent to his superior, partly from his own household troops and partly by small contingents from his sub-chiefs. These were the usual conditions, but sometimes tribes had certain privileges, commonly conceded as a reward for special services in the past. This all sounds very feudal, doesn't it? For example, the Oriola, uh, or the people of the kingdom of Oriel in Ulster, were one of these favoured tribes. They were bound to send 700 men to attend the King of Ireland in his hosting for, quote, three fortnights, unquote, every third year. But they were not to be called upon in spring or autumn when the men had to attend to their crops. Moreover, the monarch was bound to pay each man of them who attended him during the hosting or campaign a shade or cow, as he for the D, or the equivalent value, and had to make compensation to the tribe to the value of 21 cows for every man of them lost during the war. Whereas, in case of other tribes, neither pay for service nor compensation for death, sorry, neither pay for service nor compensation for death was due. The king had in his service a champion or, or, or chief fighting man called, I can't read it, Ara, sorry, Ara Echte, always a flaw or noble, chapter 5, section 2, whose duty it was to avenge all insults or offences of, offered to the families of the king and tribe, particularly murder, like the, quote, avenger of blood, quote, of the Jews and other ancient nations careful now if any expected danger from without he had to keep watch at the most dangerous ford or pass called a burna uh, burna boil or a gap of danger on that part of the border where invasion was expected and prevent the entrance of any enemy no pressure huh So Cúchulainn often, of course, fought at Fords. So that might be based on something like this, which seems to be from the Brehan Laws, yeah. He had five men-at-arms to attend on him constantly, and he enjoyed several valuable privileges. But a much larger number was at his command when he needed them for the discharge of his dangerous duties. It would appear that each tribe had a special Ara Echta, who was in the immediate service of the chief or king. King Cormac MacArth's son once insulted a woman belonging to the Deshi of Meath, whereupon Angus of the Terrible Spear, the Ara Echta of the tribe, made his way to Tara and, seizing a spear from a rack, he killed the prince with one thrust of it in open court in revenge of the insult. 
In the resulting scuffle, the king's eye was destroyed by the handle of the spear, which ultimately resulted in his abdication and in the expulsion of the Daishi from their territory. Sorry. Interesting. Because, of course, no king could be blemished. And we know that because we've discussed it on many episodes. Uh, we find that is the king having to uh, basically abdicate or step down from the throne. We find this institution existing in comparatively late times. For in the 14th century, quote, the headship of every people who revenged the insults of the O'Kellys of Hymani, unquote, belonged by right to the MacEgans. Kings and great chiefs almost always kept bodies of mercenary soldiers, commonly small in number and often as a mere bodyguard under regular pay, something like the soldiers of our present standing army, except that the Irish mercenaries were not bound so strictly to their service and might apparently leave at any time for another master. They hired themselves wherever they could get the best pay. These characteristics are alluded to in the a derivation given in Cormac's glossary for Amos or uh, Avos. If, if it's between two vowels, it would be Lenited, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, which is the Irish name for a hired soldier. Uh, uh, non uh, Amos, i.e., A M hyphen F H O S Amos, non resting. Pronounced Amos, so it, it, it's not AV, it's, it's just A M O S. He moves from place to place, from one lord to another. The temporary character of their engagement is also clearly indicated in the Brehan Law, where, in setting forth the compensation due to a chief for injuring persons he had taken under protection, it is laid down that no compensation is due for an Amos or hired soldier because it is likely that he will go away from him, uh, the hirer, without necessity. These hired soldiers are constantly mentioned in our ancient records. Queen Maeve in the Thoin boasts that she has 1,500 royal mercenaries, re Amush, of the sons of adventurers. Bodies of Scotchmen and of Welshmen ver were very often in the service of Irish kings. And we also find companies of Irish under similar conditions serving in Wales and Scotland. Think of Braveheart. Uh, the maintenance and pay of such soldiers was called in Irish Boanacht, whence men serving for pay and support were often called Bonachts by English writers of the time of Elizabeth. The practice of hiring foreign mercenaries, which was commenced at a very early period, was continued down to the 16th century. And we have already seen, pardon me, that Shane O'Neill had a number of fierce soldiers from Scotland as bodyguard. Bear with me one moment. I'm getting distracted a little bit here, but just give me one second. Um, why am I seeing old comments? I'm seeing really old comments. missing comments for some reason is the stream still up it is uh, barbara murphy is saying that didn't change for a very long time as tucson was partially founded by an irish military man who worked for the mexican government i didn't see your previous comment and it seems to be missing but anyway uh, uh, pardon me um I just have to message somebody. Family duties call. The king kept a company of household troops supported from his own revenues who commonly resided in the neighbourhood of the palace so as to be always within reach as a personal guard and who fought with him in his wars. Such a body of men was commonly called Luchtia or house company. Luch, Lucht and Chia. Uh, Marianne Kinja has joined us. Hello there. And of course, Coda is barking uh, and uh, being heard all around the world, apparently. Yes, indeed. He is getting very giddy out there. Um, 
Sometimes a tract of land was specially set apart for the residents of themselves and their families, which they tilled when not on actual service. That's a theme, isn't it? We've seen that earlier. And a district in the present county, Cavan, once devoted to this purpose, still retains the name of Loch T, now applied to a double barony. Interesting. The number, arms, and exact duties of the Loch T depended on the circumstances of the particular king, so that we find them variously described in different authorities. They consisted of men of the tribe, whereas those con constituting the Amwish or hired companies might be, and commonly were, from a distance or from another country. These several bodies constituted a small standing army, but where large armies had to be brought into the field, the men of the tribe or tribes allowing, uh, owing allegiance and service were called upon to serve. It was understood, however, that this was only for the single campaign or for some specified time, as already stated, at the end of which they were free to return to their homes. An army of men on campaign usually consisted of men of all the different kinds of service. A professional warrior or fighting man, as distinguished from a tribesman who served temporarily, was called Feinid, F-E-I-N-N-I-D, or Feini, a word allied to Fianna. A champion was also co often called a trainer, T-R-E for the I-N hyphen F-H-E-R, uh, meaning strong man. Apparently Kodo wants to read. But a more usual word for a champion or warrior is Goshkidak or Gushkia from Goshke, brave, bravery or valor. In Cleary's O'Cleary's glossary, Feinded is explained by Gotskiach. Wow. Very often a warrior was called Og or Oglach, which simply means young, a young person. And of course, in modern, in more recent history, we've had Ogly Naheran, the name for the Army of Ireland, and sometimes the uh, Provisional Army of Ireland. Um, uh, Leach or Leach is another term for a hero or warrior. Leach, L A O C H, or L E A C L A E C H. In very ancient times, there were in Ireland, as in Germany, Russia, and other countries, professional female warriors or championesses. A sort of Irish Amazons who figure much in the tales. Are there any women here today? Yes, indeed. Finally, the women are getting a mention, folks. The principal teacher of Cúchulainn in the use of his weapons was the lazy lady, lazy, <laughs> certainly she wasn't lazy, Scahach Boanad, Boanand, the daughter of uh, Ardgevne in Leha, who had a military academy in Scotland where a great many of the chief heroes of Ireland received their military education. In the Ren Dinchanicus, that is the prose Dinchanicus kept in the uh, University Library of Ren in France, uh, several female warriors are celebrated, one named Etzine and another named Brefne, who gave name to the old, the old district of Brefne. Ness, the mother of Concovar Magnessa, was a championess. Not to be confused with Loch Ness, but the same spelling. Helen is telling us that Reese is checking around the house for Coda. <laughs> he seems to have calmed down now. Uh, he was getting quite excited there now. Was there a punishment if you didn't answer the king's call to arms? Good question. And do you know what? I mean, the. Uh, Brehan laws are so comprehensive, I've no doubt that there was. I wonder, will he mention it at some point? All will remember a historic and still more celebrated championess belonging to another Celtic nation. Uh, Bo How do you pronounce that? Bodachea, is it? Whose Celtic name was Bodak, has the same meaning as a still better known queenly name, Victoria, Boad, Victory, Bodak, or or Bodach or Bodach, spelled just one without the H and one with the H at the end, victorious. 
These warlike Irish ladies sometimes fought with each other using the same weapons as men. Occasionally, too, they fought against men and proved tough antagonists. Damn straight. Isn't that called marriage? <laughs> ah, apologies for the terrible uh, humor. Monica Regley is in the house. Hello, Monica. Back at home again after our, our recent uh, 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 meeting in Ireland. Hope you had a wonderful time here and it was lovely to see you again. Uh, Catherine Cooney is here. Wonderful to see you. And we're we're delighted to see you also, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, all good. A successful rival of Skahawk. So uh, a successful rival of, of Skahawk was Aoife, who was so strong and brave that no man save Cúchulainn was able to subdue her. The warlike Maeve, Queen of Connacht, was not only a great commander, but was personally expert in the use of her weapons. In one of the battles of the Toyne, she was engaged in the fight and wounded the hero Cairn with a, a, a cast of a, a slay, S-L-E-G-H, or light spear. Wow. For these and other female warriors, see Rend in Shemekas number one, uh, paragraph 27. Fascinating. In the life of St. Machwa of Bala, there is a curious account of two highway women, Da Ban uh, Goshkiach, two women champions named Beck and Lithben. They took up their abode beside a perpendicular cliff near which travellers were wont to pass and provided themselves with a big basket having two long ropes tied to the handles. When a traveller came up, they laid hold of him and demanded all his valuables. Stand and deliver your money or your life. Uh, this is um, uh, literally highway robbery. Uh, you've often heard of the highway man, but what about the highway woman? And if he made any demur, they trundled him into the basket and swung him over the edge of the cliff, which commonly brought him to reason. <laughs> wow, what a surprise. In which case they pulled him up and sent him away unharmed, but much the poorer. On one occasion, they swung over St. Machua's gilly or servant. They they swung over St. Machua's gilly or servant. Machua himself came up at the moment and demanded that they should release him. But they, in no way cowed, refused to do any such thing till the saint had to give them his cowl off his shoulders when they drew the man up and set him at liberty. <laughs> you would expect in a tale like that for the saint to have performed some miraculous, uh, you know, uh, occurrence. Uh, which uh, you know reversed uh, the uh, the look of the uh, the assailants, but not in this case. Uh, Monica says it was lovely in Ireland. Although Peter, the one with big camera, has passed away two days after we got home. Oh no! Oh, I'm sad to hear that now. I hope that he enjoyed his last days, and if some of his last days were in Ireland, can't have been. You know, that's that's nice. It's a nice thing. But anyway, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, no match for the women. You said it, Mavanway, and I ain't arguing with that. Clergy and women exempted. I was just about to say I've been married for a quarter of a century, but <laughs> that was just uh, stupid humor. Uh, in the very early times, both clergy and women accompanied the army on campaign, and sometimes, though I think not often, took part in the fighting. But in AD 697, a meeting of clergy and laymen was held at Tara, where, at the instance of Adavnon, a resolution was adopted forbidding women to take part in war. And that is uh, the Synod of Adavnon, uh, presumably the one of the synods associated with Wrath of the Synods, Rat uh, Um the others having been organized by St. Patrick and St. Rouen. This was known as the Coin Adavnon or Adavnon's Law. A little more than a century later, in 803, Aid uh, Orni, King of Ireland, forced Connach, Primate of Armagh, and his clergy to attend him on a hostile uh, expedition against Leinster. On arriving at Dun Cor, now Rathcor in County Meath, 
Uh, the primate expostulated with him on the impropriety of bringing the clergy on such expeditions. <laughs> the king referred the matter to his tutor and chief advisor, Fohad, who, after due deliberation, pronounced judgment in the form of a short canon or rule in verse, exempting the clergy forever from attending armies in war. Wow. So all it took uh, for the, the practice to be banned uh, or to be um, uh, expunged, is that the word? Uh, it was for uh, one of the clergy uh, to complain. Yeah, wow, who'd have thought? Instruction in military science. Oh, Flaherty, we'll go for another few minutes, I think. Early Irish Contract Law by Neil McLeod and A Guide to Early Irish Law by Fergus Kelly are excellent sources, but women did not have a great deal of agency under the Brehan Law. Mm. Yeah, we had to wait till the 20th century uh, for that. O'Flaherty in his Ojigia states that Cormac MacArthur founded three colleges at Tara, one of which was for teaching military science. O'Flaherty quotes, no authority for this statement and the passage is too shadowy to found any conclusion on it. On the other hand, O'Curry writes, it does not appear from any original authority that I know of that there was in ancient Ireland any such institution as a special military school with regular professors and a regular system as in the schools of literature and law. But although we cannot, that's the end of the quote, but although, but though we cannot say that there were special military colleges, we know that the youths were carefully trained in the use of their weapons, for each was placed under the instruction of some warrior who acted as his military tutor, of which many instances might be quoted from the tales. Besides, instruction of this kind formed a part of the general education of the higher classes, and when the sons of chiefs were in fosterage, the foster fathers were bound by law to teach them, among other things, the use of their weapons. Fascinating. Oh, we've we've done very well. So I'm going to read one more paragraph and then we're going to finish for the evening. Military asylums. According to the Battle of Rossnery in the Book of Leinster, there was an asylum for the old warriors of the Red Branch in some manner corresponding with the present Chelsea Hospital and with the Royal Hospital in Dublin, where those who were too old to fight were kept in ease and comfort. And it was under the direction of one governor or commander. It was probably supported partly at the public expense and partly by payments from the inmates. But on this point, there is no information. I wonder, is there... Where, okay, that was the Battle of Rossnery in the Book of Leinster. But but where was the actual asylum? Well, well we may find out. This house is called a Rechech, or Royal House, or Palace. And also a Bruyan, uh, a Bruyan uh, which is basically a, a hostel. And it is described as very large. When Conor MacNessa, King of Ullad, was about to raise an army to oppose the southern forces under Eileen and Maeve, he went quote, to the three fifties of elders and old champions that are in their repose of age under the command of Irgalach, son of Machloch, having laid aside their exercise of, exercise of arms and their weapons, unquote, and asked them to accompany the expedition, not to fight, but to give advice as to the conduct of the campaign. Wow. I'll talk about treating your elders with respect and asking them for their wisdom, you know, and, and, and including them. Uh, instead of just literally putting them in a home and leaving them there. And they replied, quote, let our old steeds be caught and let our old chariots be yoked till we go on this expedition with thee, unquote. Fabulous stuff. This is a real eye opener. This is brilliant. I'm really, really enjoying this. There isn't a page that I've read so far that doesn't have some sort of margin note, NB asterisk or some uh, something scribbled in the side of it. So anyway, I hope you're all hope you're all in good form. Uh, right. Um, so uh, at this point, 
uh, yeah, I'll hang around for questions and comments. If, if any of you were on the walks over the weekend, thank you for joining us. I will probably do some more tours before the winter is in fully. I will probably do another tour of the Hill of Tara. I will probably do more Four Knox tours. Um, what else? Um, Four Knox, Tara, Douth, maybe? Yeah. Uh, and also, I'm thinking of doing some online stuff over the winter, some special sort of Zoom stuff. Um, but keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, I am working away and getting this calendar away to print. I uh, haven't made much progress on the Fornox monograph lately, for which I apologize, hoping that I can get a bit more time for that in the coming weeks. Um, is it possible to get on one of the tours by public transport from Dublin? It is to an extent, yeah. Uh, like you can, there's, there's very good public transport links to Drada from Dublin, hourly buses and hourly trains and sometimes more regular than that uh, in the rush hours. Um, so if you can get to Drahada, you can get to Douth fairly easily uh, or Bruna Bonia. Tara, yeah, there is a bus because I know I've, uh, I have had clients who have gotten the bus out of Dublin and it's dropped them close enough to Tara. Might be like half a mile of a walk or so. Um, where else did I say? Fornox, not so easy. Not so easy to get to Fornox. Fornox is kind of in the middle of a very rural area, you know. When are you going to do these tours, says Monica? Uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, before the days get too short and the weather gets too wet and windy and cold, you know. Uh, yes, Dublin to Tara, says Martina. There's definitely a bus there because, as I said, I've had people been dropped off. It's been one of the best stories so far. I bet you take the book to read in bed. <laughs> and no, actually not that, but no. I, uh, I, I actually have forced myself uh, in the winter and maybe it'll come back again. In the winter, I, I, re I used to read in bed, but I just decided, no, uh, the, the bed is the place for sleep because my brain is so active from early morning until late at night that I just need sleep when I need sleep. So, yeah, but I nearly would, you know. No, actually, to, at the moment, to be honest, because, you see, I know we're going to read this one. I'm going to hopefully read the whole thing on this live stream, not this single episode, you understand. But, for instance... The new book, The Early Irish Farming. Now, that's one that excites me. Uh, that's one that I nearly would take to bed, you know. If a birth on the 25th of December has a high, high, nine-month annunciation date, 25th of March, and a 40-week immaculate conception date, the 20th of March, then a birth on the 22nd of December will have a nine-month of the 22nd of March. Okay. Just saying, right? But I, my birthday is 23rd of March, so there you go. Uh, ah, no more holidays, says uh, Monica. Yeah, I know. I was also thinking of trying to do a virtual tour, but I don't know how that would work. It would depend on the quality of the uh, the live stream availability. Uh, I've been traveling back and forth between Bristol, Mid Wales, and North Wales a lot, so still not sure when I'll get the chance to cross to Ireland, but looking forward to a tour when I get there, says Mavanway. Looking forward to meeting you, and uh, yeah, brilliant. Uh, hopefully that'll be before too long. There are a lot of pentagonal stones near Langdale. Langdale Axe area, Anthony, says Don. Um, that's interesting. Are they naturally pentagonal or carved into pentagonal shapes? That's interesting. Time has flown by, says Brendan. Yes, it has. And that's what happens. Time flies when you're having fun or something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, if you haven't tried blindfolded archery, you don't know what you're missing. Yes. And on that note, I uh, brought my wife uh, shark fishing the other day. Well, she was water skiing. <laughs> Early Irish farming. You can plow through that one. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Carved, I think, Anthony says, Don. 
okay, well, well, if they're carved into pentagonal shapes, that does not sound re remotely sort of uh, Neolithic or anything like that. What era are they from, I wonder? I is that a joke, says Mavanwi? Two jokes, actually. The one about archery uh, and the one about bringing my wife shark fishing. It was going so well, says Brendan. <laughs> you don't know what you're hitting either, though. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah, You don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're hitting. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, keep an eye out for the, the calendar. As I say, hopefully in the next couple of days, all going well. The design is done. Um, so it's just a matter of, as I say, getting prices from the printers and just seeing where we go from there. Um, why does... Oswald Spengler wants to know why does Mabon seem to be less popular than Lunasa and in bulk? There is no such thing as Mabon in Ireland. Uh, uh, Mabon is not a, a, an Irish name. Uh, and I've seen posts about this recently. Uh, Lunasa was probably the biggest uh, celebration of the year. Certainly evidenced from the number of sites where Lunasa events were held even into modern times. Uh, Moira McNeil's Festival of Lunasa book is brilliant in that regard. Uh, in bulk, much less so, the beginning of spring, Bridget and all of that. Um, I don't even know what our name for uh, Autumn Equinox was. Um, all I know is that it wasn't Mabon. I think Mabon is, is Mabon is from like the Mabinogion or it's Welsh, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, but we do know that there are Neolithic alignments to the equinoxes. And presumably that's not just for spring equinox. Uh, that's for autumn equinox as well. So, you know, uh, Ken Williams of uh, Shadows and Stone has a very interesting post in the past couple of days about a stone circle where he photographed uh, the equinox sunrise and sunset, I believe. Um, uh, now, I believe that this alignment was suggested by uh, Jack Roberts, the very, very well-known Irish uh, author and um, uh, expert on stone circles um yeah so if you go to shadows and stone um hang on maybe i can share a link to the post uh yes i can just if anybody's on facebook this is an interesting one um, anyway yeah it doesn't really answer your question uh, except for that mabon is not irish you know as uh, zen in the art of archery blind archery <laughs> I haven't come across anything in early Irish literature about autumn equinox, just Samhain. I um, I wrote about this, uh, the lack of reference to equinox in Irish literature. I can't remember whether I only wrote that for patrons or whether it's on the website somewhere. Give me a second till I uh, just find out equinox. Find out if it's on the website now. Pardon me. Uh, I have none of it. The only way to discern today is la, 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 la. why would it be important? It's good. It's current E, current E, is that sun and moon, advanced astronomy. Yeah, but that's not the one that I'm looking for. I wrote something about. Um, if people can tolerate the. Uh, where did I write that? I definitely wrote that somewhere. Um, if you can, I mean, if people don't mind hanging on, I can uh, maybe look for it. Um, I'm going to look for it on Patreon. At patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Folks, if you are interested in becoming a patron and supporting Mythical Ireland and getting something in return for that support in the form of access to articles and blog posts and podcasts and videos and photographs and all sorts of stuff how do i search now that's the next question can i just search my page or do i have to do it a block at a time i'm pretty sure there's a search feature somewhere search posts equinox Just bear with me here uh, for a second. Sorry about this. Um, but anyway, I'm, hopefully nobody's anywhere to go. Uh, Sotinar says, Mabon isn't exactly real. It's a load of Wiccan nonsense based off some real Welsh mythology. 
yeah but i suppose maybe the question is what why is it that equinox um you know doesn't have the same I'm looking for it here. I wrote about this. I wrote about the fact that there was very little. Now, it wasn't a long article, as from what I can remember. I wrote about the fact that, you, you know, you, you, there's, there's, I couldn't find a reference to Equinox. And I even wrote about the fact that the Equinox was mentioned in a, a, a couple of manuscripts under its... Uh, latin name or or the irish version of the latin name you know of course i can't find it now can't find it folks let me just go back to the mythical ireland website and search through the all the results because i just searched for equinox ah the myths and legends of saint patrick lieu of the long arm ancient astronomers note celebrating sheila's day how on earth did Newgrange handle leap year? Um, what is this? Early March cosmic vision, lunar symbolism. Jesus, uh, it always reminds me how much material there is on the website. Um, no, can't find it. Cannot find it. Or was it something I even wrote in Mythical Ireland, the book? I don't know. Yeah, Bridget is more, sort of very strongly tied with that in bulk. Um, What did equinox mean to a Neolithic astronomer? Yeah, but it was this, what I wrote was specifically relating to the lack of mention of equinox in mythological material. So we've, we've plenty of mentions of Lunas and Samhain, for instance. Fewer references to Inbulk and Bealtaine, I think, in Irish myth. Um, but apparently none at all to the equinox. That is just, that is bugging me now. Anyway, I've set myself a task, which is find out when or where that I wrote about the lack of, um, lack of reference to the equinox in Irish myth, which Caitlin has prompted me there. Uh, I, I remember reading somewhere that the solstices were most solstices were most important, but I can't find it either. Yeah, how did they? You know, I don't know. It seems that the cross quarter days were more get more mention in, in the mythological material. You know, according to MacKillop, that is uh, the dictionary of Celtic mythology, presumably the Oxford dictionary. Uh, Mabon is derived from Maponos, a Celtic god of Roman occupied Britain and Gaul, uh, often linked to Apollo. The equinoxes are exactly halfway between the traditional seasons of the Celtic calendar. Well, in this case, halfway between, uh, yes, uh, Lunasa and. Uh, and so on. Yeah, exactly. Um, all those other astronomical dates, days are important in agriculture. Autumn equinox, not so much that I can see. One moment. Bear with me. I mean, there are still 48 people watching. Bear with me until I find my book about the year and the calendar. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Where am I? Celtic year. Uh, the year in Ireland. Kevin Danaher. Oh, yeah. Okie dokie. Let me just quickly find out. The Celtic Year by Shirley Toulson. Um, 
Where are we? September. September. Okay, these are more like Christian celebrations. So Welsh monk, Adavnon, sole friend to Finnica, king of Ireland. Adavnon was born in, and became the abbot of Iona. No, that's not the one I want. It's Danaher. But I'm not sure if Danaher mentions the autumn equinox at all. Let me see. Let me see. Pattern day. Michael Mass. It would appear that the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel, 29th of September, had no special significance under the older Irish system of time reckoning. And uh, it was the Anglo-Normans who gave Michael Mass an important place in the calendar at the end of the harvest. Okay, so we're going to go before that pattern day, which is, is that set to a specific date? August the 15th, according to this one. The Assumption, which is the 15th of August. St. Bartholomew's Day, 24th of August. No, it's not there. Anyway, that's going to bug me about where I wrote about the lack of reference to the equinox, but uh, I'll find it. I'm sure I will. Anyway, enough uh, of my diving into rabbit holes. Folks, Thank you very much for joining us for the 244th episode of uh, Live Irish Mits. Uh, hopefully you'll come back again next week. In the meantime, uh, do keep an eye on the social media. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube and Twitter, although don't use Twitter very much, to be honest. Uh, Facebook, of course, is the main page, Mythical Ireland page. But don't forget there's also the Mythical Ireland community where you can post stuff and you can interact more than you can on the page. Uh, I'd love to see you there. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, as of course I always ask, is subscribe to the channel so that you'll get notified and ring the bell so that you get notifications of when the live streams are on. Some people say that they don't get notifications. I hope you have a great day wherever you are in the world or, or a great night or a great morning. Uh, and we'll hopefully see you all very soon. Keep an eye on the website over the next couple of days for the calendars and, uh, of course, on the social media as well and for any upcoming tour dates, which I will hopefully announce soon. Thank you all for gathering around us in our virtual setting here on Live Irishmits. Hope to see you very soon. Ikawa Kolosov, Slong Gafol, August Toga Bogay